Hi, I guess uh, we are in line to do something rather like a Christmas present. <laughs> a lot of you have been asking for, um, for some demonstrations, and I will do more and more, but uh, at the moment here, I'm going to, I was doing an experiment with uh, charcoal and, uh, and uh, videotaped it, trying to figure out what the best lighting for videotaping is. I decided to go ahead and use it and speak over it because I can finish doing uh, my, my uh, effort at uh, understanding all the problems associated with doing it this way, including uh, uh, playing it back to you now and speaking over it. So you're going to be seeing me demonstrating uh, a charcoal start and uh, overlook the fact that I do something here that I tell students never to do, which is to use uh, paper with, uh, with significant dings in it or, or rolls in it so you can see a serious uh, 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 value shift, you know, um, the, on the surface, the undulating paper. At any rate, so uh, let's get the uh, 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 thing started, but... Um, and I'm just going to talk my way all the way through the whole thing. And um, I'm told not to give you any airspace, but if I do, just enjoy the show. <laughs> um, and this one here is um, thanks to my producer insists that I must do something like this just for you guys. I think you've been very interested in the, in the demonstration portion. So, all right, Merry Christmas. Uh, assuming this comes out anywhere near Christmas. doing this in artificial light. Uh, so uh, that's nice, nice and friendly and warm. <laughs> it's also less changeable, uh, good for drawing purposes. If you have a soft enough light, it's okay. All right, what you see me doing is what I inevitably do at the beginning of a painting, uh, not <laughs> of a charcoal, I should say, of anything. I, st I, uh, I shouldn't say a painting because just in charcoal, I'm looking for top and bottom. I'm not setting up color notes out there and I'm not setting up value masses. When I, when I draw this way. I'm rather using line just a bit to hunt for the top and the bottom, and then uh, I proceed to uh, move those in relation to each other a little bit, and, uh, and then proceed. As you can see, the paper has a few blips in it, which is really not ideal. Uh, it's not even a particularly good paper. I've never used it before. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it's like fish wrap, truly. <laughs> the good old school stuff, right? <laughs> All right, um, this part here, Ang said, start slow so you can finish fast, right? Take your time. Uh, you gotta think about what you'd like to have for the bottom and the top. First of all, you need something that's visual, that's strong enough to actually perform for you so you can see it. Um, and so that means silhouetting. And uh, secondly, you want something that actually um, uh, will, um, uh, I'm sorry, and so the rest of that is so that you can actually get it, you can see the top while you're looking at the bottom, that's ultimately the goal. Um, so I'm gonna see if I can use pointers, it might be useful in this thing. Uh, actually, I realize I can't use pointers, <laughs> because this is a, what's happening is I'm just speaking over, this has already been taped, so I wish I could, but I can't, okay. So you see me on the left side now, I'm making a mark over there. It has something to do with the left side maybe of his nose or something like that. So I'll do a top and bottom, and then I'm looking for a left and or a right. But I, you have to anchor, this, this is called anchors, and so you, what you have to do is you have to set a top and bottom. And you have to keep them, by the way. Don't go messing around moving them. Now you're basing the choice of top and bottom on where you want them in the picture. Do you want them, you know, let's say you always are looking rather through a viewfinder and you're working from nature. So the, you already know about how far from the top of the frame and how far from the bottom of the frame you want those two parts to land. And the next part of it, though, is the search for equilibrium. And that is, equilibrium is merely um, the idea that if you were to drop a visual line down through the middle, well, if you dropped a plum through the middle of your ensemble, say I'm the ensemble, drop a plum right down the middle of me, and you move it back and forth until you find this point of equilibrium. That's, that's going to be the center of your paper. And you see this, uh, this ear up here. It looks like it's rather near center, doesn't it? I'm doing that right ear of the, of the horse. Uh, by the way, this is, only, this is going to be an hour long, 
Uh, well, as you already seen, I suppose. And uh, uh, it's not going to be finished. I'm sorry I destroyed the second half of this thing. Uh, there had been another almost a whole hour more. Uh, but I was in this mood of thinking, well, I'm not going to use this anyway. I just did it for an experiment. But I decided it's actually worthwhile for you to see. Talking about the charcoal, in the way we work, the way I was trained, uh, there's two things. One, one in New York, we never used anything but, but charcoal stumps, you know what I mean? With Boston, with, in Boston with Gamel, we sharpen charcoals to a very fine point. I think uh, that would be in the category of what Gamel called a dental instrument. Here I'm not doing that. Uh, this is going to be mass oriented. It's going to be edge oriented, okay? As soon as this thing gets moving, you're going to see values, dark things, creating silhouette. And at that point, you make the edge however you can. It's much more efficient not to have a little point there. Um, all you guys who are students of mine now, you can um, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> a lot of what I teach, uh, you know, is, is really actually the Gamel Foundation. And um, a lot of what I do, and that's typical of any painter, um, is, is that and other things. And um, all right. So let's see um, where I am so far. Uh, by the way, if you touch it with your little finger like that, I'm just taking off charcoal. And um, if you do it, make sure your little finger isn't greasy. This whole thing, rub it on your finger. Uh, rub, it, rub it on your shirt, on your something. Rub that portion. By the way, if you use your little finger for leaning on the paper, uh, uh, really do the same thing. Make sure that you don't have a greasy finger because it's going to be very hard for the charcoal to take, even on good charcoal paper. Uh, if you've done that. So it, it's one of those things where if you had a, if you could have a, um, I've never tried it. I'm not, I'm not one for, 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 for uh, tricks and methods and, and gloves and stuff, but a white glove might not be a bad tool in a setting like this. I prefer to have my, the skin touching the charcoal for purposes of touch, but I suspect you could learn that. Now what I'm doing here, and just as you're seeing it now, I've been around a bit, and I suggest to, to people that you see the getting around part as as doing the five points of a star. You say you'd start here, top and bottom, and then you're down here, and you're back here, and you're over here, and you're down here again, and you've made that five-pointed star you learned to do in grade school. And uh, so I've done that. I've been around a bit looking for the lay of the land. Uh, remember, the initial phase of this thing I think of as the arabesque in a very different way from what other people do, but these are significant points. So I don't say the arabesque, but an arabesque. And so I'm looking for points and I'm trying to find their relationships to each other to the point where they create a, um, uh, a, the right geometric configuration, right? So it'll be it a triangle or a hexagon or something like that. Six, I'm just, that's just saying a six-sided figure. It could be a five, four. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a figure created by these points. A second thing I'd like to mention now is that I work from points. And um, so what, where many people I know, and I've seen some of the Gamel people uh, work from, you know, larger lines sort of blocking out the territory. I think that's more typical of what you'd see in, in uh, uh, Harold Speed, for example. Uh, that's not me. I'm not doing that. I actually am much more interested in points, and I'm suggesting that I'm referring to the sergeant uh, model, which is some mixture of those things, of that, or the other I just mentioned, with the idea of points. He refers to points and angles. So when you put a point up, like that point of the ear up there, and you begin to mass that stuff, by the way, and that's to create a really good top. The point of the ear won't survive very long up there. It doesn't do enough. So eventually you're going to have to put a little bit of the horse's mane up there, get some more articulation up there. Now, you, don't, you can't know for sure how wide that'll be until you get more mass reading down below. So now I'm down at the bottom of the page having decided that the top edge of that, of, that, um, of that white bar on which the uh, figure seems to be standing, the very top of it is my best reading line, and I'm going to try to use that right over into the guy's foot as my low point. Uh, so you can see where I do that, and by this, the massing here that's going on, I'm trying to keep it even. I don't want it to look spotty and chunky and interesting. I want it to look like you wouldn't even be able to see it. It's just even. And that's because I don't want it to draw attention to itself in, in a textury uh, kind of a way. But, but I'm going to have to find the end of that white blot down there because I need something to get an angle. So I have the low point, which is somewhere along the, uh, uh, that bar of light, and you can see it there. I want to point at it, but I can't through the screen. Uh, 
And so that's, that's gonna be sharpened up to a light effect. And then I'm looking for the, so what you might call the toe of, not the guy, but the toe of that light, the very left edge. And I'm trying to get that at that point, at some point, I'm trying to get that angle right to the ear, okay? So that's my low point established as a semi-horizontal line. It's got a bit of an angle to it with a bit of an edge and a bit of a silhouette now. As you can see, I haven't stuck around and just done line drawing. This is not a line drawing. This is, this is mass, points and masses, okay? I think of painting, by the way, as this whole thing is a, is a uh, 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 what would you say, an articulation and a flow, you know, something like that. I, I, love, I love that expression that was used by David in a completely uh, 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 commonplace way. He talks about joints and rollers. And I think of that as the points you're looking at here are, are joints, the, the points. And then there's a lot of, a lot of unity, the, there's a lot of flow until you get to the next point. So I think of the flowing unity that lands that you're not gonna be working on right now and keeping it together as the roller. So that's a kind of a concept. Um, so you're gonna find your own ways, by the way, of naming these things, giving your own names to them, something that means something to you, but understand the idea, if you can, uh, of, of the point, right? And a point, by the way, is just, is just any line uh, that then turns a corner. You know, say, say it could be my hand, and you just see a line like this turning a corner, that becomes a point. Now, all sorts of things, I mean, this could be a point. I mean, all, there's all kinds of things that make these bends, but the bend is something you can use, as it were, geometrically. It has to be in the right place this way, in the right place this way, and therefore useful. That's the value of the point, if you think, if you remember the old uh, geometry lessons. So, um, and take enough care in these areas to actually get uh, a, as much of the look of nature as you can without torturing yourself. And don't do it prematurely so because you get precious, but make it as like as you can in a way uh, that won't make you precious. Make it, make it suggest strongly the look of nature at that spot. But if you make it really fine, you'll care too much about it. And all of a sudden you won't be free to move it. Every point I'm making out here is mobile. I put something down, I move it three times. Basically, that's the fundamental thinking. Uh, and then stay awake that you might l learn that maybe a little more yet or another move. Uh, so one of the interesting things that happens right here is you're, you're in a world of, of uh, already of backstragglers. You only have a few points, but they have to be right to each other already. And this is where people don't go slow enough. You think just let's load up points, let's load up points, and, and then, well, and then what? If these points aren't well set in relation to each other, right? So they need to be well expressed visually, near their, their edges, the suggestion of their light effect. And uh, by the way, that also in relation to other value contrast to the extent that you uh, can make use of it at this point. Uh, but certainly their locations in space, their angles to other points, Every time you put in a new point, it's going to have an angle relationship to all the other points. You might as well just take a quick look, see how you did. You know, every, it's not a simple problem of just simply saying, all right, this is halfway from the top to the bottom, this is a halfway chunk. You actually need it to be at the right angle to all the other points. And we're drawing from the idea of useful points now, visual points that are, that are helpful in establishing uh, strong and important visual things. Let me start with that again. I said top and bottom at the beginning. And uh, there's two points in the way we draw. One is that we do top and bottom. And the other is we do the order of things strong by strength. In other words, we're doing, um, we're doing the strongest players. That's what I call visual order, by the way. The strong players come to your eye first. There's a kind of an order to that uh, for that reason, right? Which is why when you blur your eyes and you can only see these three or four points, you know which ones you're going to be working on. Apart from setting top and bottom, sometimes they it's a good thing that they tend to be top and bottom. It's not unusual for them, some of the strongest points to be in those areas, and you can just use them. Uh, but sometimes you have to set a top and bottom that's fairly weak. You still draw it relatively weak, even you know you don't make it artificially strong. And then as you're going around, as you put other points in, the, more of the strong points and getting those guys out there, you keep that one down and. Um, and, but you begin to establish the visual order of the points. I'm not sure I, you know, watching, my, my conversation goes sideways when I'm watching action. Um, 
But you see how this is happening. Um, these are points that are beginning to be, they're rather vignetted. It's, you know that word, it, it, it means you've isolated a, an object and then pushed away the values from the edges so that it sort of floats there. And we're trying to do that, we're pushing away from the sharp edges that we've drawn, the shapes that we're working on. We're pushing the values away from that. We're creating a silhouette there, but we're pushing the values away so as not to have a conversation about the other side of whatever hits those other values. So you can see it's some smudges that are sort of all over the place. It looks like the one on the far right is going to be the, uh, the base of that shadow on the neck of the horse. It's some sort of a locator. Um, the, uh, this is the beginning of locating the, the, the length of the horse's uh, nose, where that place comes. Um, up to that point, we've drum, done some marks um, that are getting the angle between the ear and the nose point. And, uh, you, um, you simply continue to wait for, for that to show itself to you. Remember when you do points and angles, you're always doing it, I think uh, in the sergeant conversation, he says, don't let the plumb out of your left hand. So these angles are functions of vertical. If you don't have vertical fixed in your brain, and you can have vertical fixed in your brain if you just make sure the left edge of your paper uh, is, is um, vertical, and you have vertical sitting right in front of you all the time. So do make sure that it's vertical when you're drawing there. Um, by the way, even if your paper is tilted back, you can still have that vertical. If it's perpendicular to your eye, that left edge can still be vertical and won't hurt anything that I've seen. By the way, if you put the paper further over from the edge of the board, make sure it's parallel to the edge of the board. So there's two verticals, which is even nicer. Then you can use that vertical to relate the angles of the horse in internally. You can use that vertical. You can always hang a string, you can always hang a plum. Uh, but it's, it's really the mentality of vertical that you're getting your angles right to, right? And by the way, it's not important. Plumbing is not very important in itself. There are a few places that plumb and they should be right, but the, anything you're drawing is full of angles. And, and so the angles are what have to be righted, not vertical. Vertical plumbs, plumb this, the plumb that, fine. But what you really need to do is get your angles right to vertical, okay? All right. So we're beginning to get around a bit. I'm going to stick my nose in a little closer, see what I'm missing here. Uh, every, every spot I'm working on is um, strategic, right? You would say, what, what will help me is the way I think of this. So um, uh, in every possible way, by the way, and, I, and, I, and every picture, by the way, it's different. You know, I've never been able to set up a formula that says, you know, first we do the head, and then we do the, the, the shoulders, and then we do the feet. Um, I've never found a, a one that says uh, first we do exactly anything and then something else. I find the picture itself, the setting, the, the, the visual ensemble dictates that to you. Not enormously, because you can see that I still approach top and bottom. You know, I still need major parameters, and I need to be able to locate it well on the page. Some of those things are definitely very early, but, you, but the ones that are going to be most helpful in letting your eyes see how you're doing, you know, letting yourself do this with your eyes, right? You'll find some things are far more strategic to, than others. And uh, set up major, for example, they may set up ma bigger proportions, right? Major masses, uh, whereas if you do a lot of little things and they don't set up big masses, they're not as good for your, for your, for your big impression. Remember, we're working, no matter what little thing we draw in this, we're always working with a mentality of pre-vision, pre-visualized pre idea of the whole, right, in the first place. And then we're working from the greater to the lesser. You know, the greatest of all, in a sense, is the top and bottom, because that's a big proportion in the thing. And, and you know, the idea of the outside in is significant. We do rather work from the outside in, but we don't exclusively work from the outside in. We work from strong things as well, which you're going to see in just a few seconds here. So you go back, you return to things like perhaps the mane up at the top of his head up there. Sorry, I couldn't do this from the same angle that I, that I did the photo. That's one of those things where I suppose I would have to have a second camera or something working if I wanted you to be able to watch the exact image. I still can't say I'd be able to do that because I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be, I'm going to be blocking it from a camera. So unless I wear one on my forehead. Um, but remember, you go back to these places and you make them more useful or you make them more correct. So if you, and the top and bottom are always, you know, you're always inclined to keep working on them, to keep returning to them, to make them more impressive, to make them more uh, precise, so that they can be more useful, okay? 
Remember, remember, this is all silhouettes. I like that Degas says it's all silhouettes. And you're talking about a guy who obviously worked with line, uh, and you and clearly outlines of objects. His idea of drawing was uh, was what happens between the contours. Uh, that may or may not be true. I mean, it is true with academic painting, but uh, this process where you were I'm giving you here is is significantly different from that. Um, um, yeah. So, I think I lost a point there, but all right. So you can see this. This is there's a move here now to the chest of the horse, which is a very long angle. It's it's got a rounding edge, so it's not a great point maker, but it's you can still use points like you could even use lost spots in a picture as those points, something to measure with if you if it's actually the best uh, element out there. Go ahead and use it. At no point here will you find that I'm drawing the horse's chest. No, there's no such thought in my head. I'm always drawing shapes and shape relationships. So, uh, so as I said, the, the, the order is actually the order of helpfulness, you know. And when I draw something, I try to draw it right in contrast, right in edge in relation to other things that are already sitting there. And I see me know literally other silhouettes, other shapes that are made by silhouette, silhouetting uh, effects. You know, we talk about silhouette, but we really just mean a dark meets a light. In some places, the true silhouette idea, which is, a, which is uh, what you see when you, you know, shine a light from, 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 the, from behind a, a screen through somebody's hand, you see that cut out there, we think of that as a silhouette. Uh, but what we really do is we work from, probably a, there's a, probably a better word than silhouette, and that is contrast itself, right? Just contrast, or you could say light effects. Every time I see a dark meta light, I see light. I mean a dark meta, meet a, a light in that sense. I think light effect, okay? So uh, each place I'm going, even though I'm not here doing full value, which is another phase, which you can do or not do, by the way, in doing a drawing, um, you still have to have value order. You still have to have light effect order, okay? So be aware that I'm doing that. I'm trying to, for example, what I just worked on down there on the, on the shoulder of the, the horse is a really soft edge down there. And so I'm differentiating that from places where I've already made sharp ones. And what happens sort of, you might say willy-nilly, is I'm forced to go back and review those early places. You'll find me back there at the baseline of that light uh, that the um, mannequin is standing on. I'll be back there um, uh, sharpening that edge up, sharpening up that effect, perhaps. Remember, every time you're doing an angle, there's not just an angle to vertical relationship. Every time you do an angle, the angle relates to all the other angles, but very specifically to ones that you can see communing with it, shall we say? Now, ones off, off which it plays in a beautiful way. Those are going to be the ones you're most receptive to. So, so, so listen. You don't mean listen with a with a with an ear to. To, to enjoyable play. And uh, you're going to find this process is, 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 a, is a delight just about every minute. Another point I'll make, uh, by the way, as I go around a, a drawing like this, is I'm looking for some sense of reward. And, I, and I'd say that meaning the look of nature gives me that. You know, when I get a shape right and have a soft, and have the edge turning softly the way it should, uh, there's this sense of well done, you know. And then even if it's in the wrong place, you're going to do it even better the next time. You have to have that mentality, by the way. That's a Paxton comment. Remember how much fun it was the first time. Remember, it'll be, it'll be twice as much fun the next time, or even more fun the next time around. So remember that, is, that idea, though, is also uh, perpetuated by Paxton. That is that, that you're not just putting things down and then leaving them and fixing them in place. What you're putting them down for is to get a set of things out there and then begin to play them to each other. So you put them down just to move them, okay? So remember, drawing, just like painting, drawing is adjusting, right? Writing is rewriting. Uh, so when you're putting color notes out there, as we did a bit ago, you're setting up these notes, and then you're adjusting them. Once you have the third and fifth note, then you say to yourself, is that set beginning to be this set? No, no, that first note I put down actually ought to be more X, more blue, more something. Well, the same thing is happening even with these edges in here, or the shapes. As soon as you see an angle somewhere, you immediately start relating it to things. Uh, 
and uh, you and if you relate them well, meaning if you relate them in to to angles in this particular case, if you relate them out of vertical and relate them to any number of sets of angles with which they go, you know, which with, which 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 produce between them a beautiful appeal, uh, go with that. I've spoken before in some of my t talks about um, uh, Michelangelo's um, counter, I think he called it counterpoint, it's uh, possibly a week. It's, it's been such a long time since I read the actual location too, uh, this, the thing on, you know, in the in, its, in, it, in, 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 in person, in a book, that um, I would argue that I'm probably not saying it precisely, but the, the message I took away from it is he was, when he, it was really a significant thing, and that he, so much that he talks about it, this idea of when he picked up the, how beautiful it was when the hip came over like this, and then picked up the calf down there, right? So that idea of play of shape, uh, and so we don't just talk about the play of angles, we talk about the play of shape. So when you see a curve, back up mentally. You have to back up. You can't be just focusing on things. Even if you're making something, make it, make it, you know, make it as like as you can and back, keep backing up and seeing it to, to other things and adjust it to other things, okay? But it applies to everything. It applies to shape, so it applies to curves, and you expect, there's some expectation, just like angles play to angles, that curves will play to curves. And, uh, and forms will play to forms, so a rounded a thing with a round sensation will will uh, uh, play to to either something flat or to several other round uh, uh, rounding qualities. So you can see how the closure is starting to happen it's between the nose of the horse there and the chest. There's, this mass has gotten bigger and bigger, hasn't it? It's just, that's that that's that attempt not to have so many points that you get confusing even to yourself. So you can get only a certain number of points out there, and you want to immediately pull things together a bit, right? And uh, that's what I call those great sweeping unities. So it's not just the points, but it's how all these points, um, it's what they're setting up and how the masses between them, uh, you know, quiet the whole thing and then focus you over on those places. So it's still the vignetting idea though. I'm not going out there and drawing to the edge of the canvas yet. Uh, and uh, you can do that anytime you want, but you are, um, you know, you are in, right now in a position where you're floating points. And again, this is Paxton talking, as I recall it, and that is the idea of um, the floating, right? Not, he says anybody can, can connect, connect things in a drawing, but keep them floating, keep them floating for a while, right? And what could be more important than points themselves, though? Floating diagonals, you know, that may be something, you can move it over, move it over, but you need to actually fix points. So think of you, you guys who do this construction drawing, think about doing it, even if you insist on doing it, think of how important it is to make points. One thing I'm gonna to say to you though, is that this is visual drawing, this has got nothing to do with sight size. It's got nothing to do with anything you, you've, um, it's not got nothing to do with preliminary drawing of any kind, including construction drawing, which made me think about that. There's no pre-measuring, there's no pre-calculating anything. We're putting up visual content. The world as we see it, in its order of strength, right? That's it, and which you gotta be good at. And I realized it sort of early on when I was sorting this out as a student, that uh, if you're not good with big, easy things, you're not gonna be any good. Get good with the big, easy things, you know, you're given that. Um, if you can't draw stuff that's easy to see and get it right in relation to other things that are easy to see, it ain't gonna get easier from here. And that's what these kind of points up here represent, right? Um, so, um, yeah, it is what it is. Uh, you'll begin to see at a point like this, and even earlier, they, the, the whole thing is being implied now. You can feel the gesture of it. You can feel the proportions. And uh, would that you could see how thin this is. I mean, I, it's obviously the view that we have from here is it's considerably wider. But you can understand, moving further over, it's going to narrow the horse's view. This horse is an interesting one, isn't it? It's... Um, this particular individual horse, I think it's, a, it's a, from a French uh, sculpture, but the horse's head is from the Parthenon, and it's been used by Rubens and everybody else you can think of as the model, you know, for horses' heads. It's interesting, a Rubens studio would have uh, casts of arms and hands and things like that for use. Uh, you know, for when you needed an arm for something, you didn't have to hire models, you just drag down an arm off the wall, you know. Plaster casts of arms, by the way, I don't mean to be crazy <laughs> again the um, the point uh, you can make points without a uh, 
without a sharpened charcoal. Um, by using the sharpest edge you happen to be dealing with at a given time. But that same charcoal, but that, you don't have to put it down if you, uh, if you use it to, ma you then use it to mass with. Um, so if it doesn't have to be, it can, it's just a, the same charcoal. And the process is definitely speeded up by doing it this way. I don't know if, um, I mean, one of the things we did with Gamma, and the reason we used a point was because the whole model back then, the, the academic one was, and it was also still included at the museum school. Um, so I don't think they ever changed any of that stuff under uh, Tarbell and the Boston School guys that taught there, where they just drew, there's a really careful, articulate razor blade, thin, um, razor thin line around things. Um, complete, you know, just worked it until they had really thought they had this perfect line and then they would begin some other process, sometimes literally modeling from the top down. It's interesting the difference between some way some people work today with the crudeness of their marks and then they start noodling from the top down. I find that really quite interesting. But, and, uh, but this is uh, what I'm doing actually is, what's fun about this is you're actually articulating the look of nature at these given spots. And then the third time around, when you move it or when you adjust it to something, you're making it more like each time and making it more articulately or more, more, more specifically. And uh, to some of you, um, uh, and I'm thinking of one of my Canadian friends, you, you, uh, you, know, you know who you are. <laughs> you um, uh, have the um, uh, idea that it's detail, but it's not detail, it's just specificity, right? It's just being specific on a point that you're actually having to make right now. For example, where the ear goes over to the other ear, that width up there now has become really important. You have to be right on the money with that. But you have to be specific about what the edges of those things are doing. Those darks meet with sharp edges. They, the lights meet the darks with sharp edges. You have to have the look of nature at those points. But it's not a noodling problem. And that's where you can blow it off. You can just blow it on in a stroke sometimes. Some people call it sketching. It's not sketching. It's more particular than that. But you do have to have a concept of it sort of fixed in your eye and mind. Uh, again, as, uh, as, as Hang is constantly talking about. Uh, by the way, isn't it nice you can just turn me off if we, when you want to watch, just watch this thing. <laughs> but, but listen to me all you want. I, I, I almost feel like I should leave blank spaces in here, but actually it's probably not that good an idea, since you can turn me off anyway. Uh, <laughs> I, I do these videos so you can just turn me off. Isn't that fun? I often find myself whistling. I'm unconscious of it. It's very strange. I don't, I don't know if it's fragments of tunes or if what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping my producer uh, eliminated all those noises um, from the video so you can just hear me speaking. I hope I'm not speaking over whistling. I mean, he'd probably want it to be, you know, provide some atmosphere, but... <laughs> One thing I'm picking on myself for just here is, um, is that I haven't done more more specific, specific articulation, I pointed out, the, uh, where the uh, leg of the, um, or some of the parts of the mannequin are meeting because they create a distance uh, from the top of the head down on the right corner that's actually quite significant. So I'm hoping I'll get onto that pretty soon, but it is in the category of where I'm not trying to do a horse and don't be thinking I am. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have that baseline in there, you know, the very top and bottom. Uh, by the way, think of this the way we work is, is a top and a bottom, and everything is a subdivision of that, right? Now, that may seem easy to say, you know, like if you do a figure, you do here's top and bottom, and then you just put the, at eighth, at one eighth, you make the head mark and all those sorts of things. We're not doing anything like that. Um, in fact, the linear thing is not very visual. When a, when a horse's nose goes from his ear, or I'm sorry, when the, when the angle of the head goes from the nose to the ear at an angle, it's much more difficult to see that measurement, but so you have to be seeing it in various other ways. Let yourself have some of these other ways. So you see how you have to get more specific around the nose, not more, not more detail, it's just more, well, it's only more detail to the extent you don't have a really good point. So if you go around something, and by the way, when you're doing the memory part, <laughs> memorize around and through a point and down and learn to draw that. I remember one point uh, Gamel said to me, he pointed down at the corner of a cast and the cast was sitting there and there would have been the bottom of the base of the cast and I'd drawn a line this way and I'd drawn a line that way and there's a big X and, he's, and Gamel's point to me, he was, says, I don't see an X out there. <laughs> so why are you drawing something like that? Well, that's the construction model where you do X's all over the place. I mean, gash line, gash line. 
But so he, that was a very important point that he was making to me, to draw the look of nature at that point. Really very much the points and angles process here. Remember, Gamble is an interesting mixture of, of, the, um, of, of the ideas associated with the Boston School and the words, but also with this other thing, you know, which is models, for example, coming out of the academic world, which were also part of his early training. His earliest training was with um, um, Sergeant Kendall. Um, is it William Sergeant Kendall? I'm trying to think of his first name. Uh, who wound up teaching at, at Yale. Um, but um, he had, so he did cast, cast drawings for him, but apparently uh, Sergeant Kendall never even looked at them in person, which Gamel thought was decidedly uh, uh, poor teaching. Um, uh, conveyed a poor message, but it does show you that people, everybody assumed that there's some good use for a drawing from the cast. So these internal marks, um, you know, the uh, it may be that they're there because it gives me a much better line between, say, the ear and all the way down to the to the to the middle of the, you know, some some dramatic angle or something. Uh, but you can also argue that they're just flat, strong. Okay. Uh, the cheek down there is from the stand, the view I have over there is just really strong. The cheekbone on the horse is just one of those really strong points. And it also, uh, one of those really strong silhouetting edges. And it also makes a good point. Uh, it's when I, when you find yourself working in spots like that, when I find myself there, I know it's because I'm not getting enough mileage out of something else. I'm looking for something that'll help me, uh, visual, help me to, 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 fix locations in my eye better. And anytime you have a point, especially between, say, the tip of the ear and the tip of the something, the nose of the something down there, and it lands rather on a line with those things, <clears throat> not a plum necessarily, and makes a point, uh, it's not a bad thing to have in there. You can see down on the where the base is, I'm still picking on myself for not having done that sooner. I, I think I get to it, but I get to it immediately in the second in the second hour of this thing. But I but I really should have the whole right character going just a little bit more uh, than I do. I'm being a bad example to you here. Not a totally bad one. I'm doing the things I say I do. But <laughs> one of the things that you see me doing there is uh, is blowing the form over of the skull. What I'm doing is putting a middle tone on it there, so it presents visually more truly. So we don't do cutouts. Uh, if you find just an area looking cutout, we do the general impression. So if that area looking cutout uh, isn't true, it actually is a, the greater statement is a tubular form, then you could blow on this great tubular form and then again take another look and see what ought to be showing through that. Uh, what silhouette has enough strength to actually be useful. So you're always wanting to do that sort of combination of, of form an edge, or one of the things I try to say to people is don't you see that when you do, say the shape of the horse's head, there's a cutout on the left side of the head making that shape, and there's a non-cutout on the right side. In other words, there's a tubular form or lost areas going up and down the entire right side of the mask. You know that light effect, by the way, do you see there the face? We refer to that as a mask. And that thing, um, that mass, is, is a shape, right? But its edges aren't the same. So you, can't, you don't want to just cut it out in a mechanical process. You want to immediately, you want to find the shapes and turn the edge and look at the shape after that, okay? So that's again, that look of nature leading you, right? So if you're making the width of the, of the face and the edge is sharper on the left side and less sharp on the right side, do it that way. Get the look of nature visually that way as well. So you're, everything is coming up at once. I want to say, Nothing matters more than in this way of working that we consider two things, and that is we're all over the place at once in the star. That was that star thing I was showing you. And then uh, uh, all the horses at once in the star, right? This is Boston's whole conversation, just fundamental, just basic fundamental stuff. So we're after line and mass, we're after proportion and we're after angle, we're after uh, sh you know, shape, and we're after form. So it's all simultaneous, right? And that's the gift that this gives you. If you say, if you accept that everything we're drawing is just masses, and what happens at their edges, right? 
Now, if they're light masses, or if they're masses in, in light, right? so not just lit masses, but, but they actually are, have a form idea, one of those things you can do is as soon as the thing looks cut out, you can blow the, the round, roundness into it because it's going to look false as a general impression unless you do. I hope some of this is coming across. Um, I'm still picking on myself a bit. Uh, now, for not being down there on the right, uh, in the right uh, guy, um, I'll get to some of that, uh, but it's not a good idea to wait really long uh, because those are all contributors. So I'd, if my students are listening to this, just turn it off for a while and, and <laughs> do something else. Not kidding. Uh, <laughs> it's not that this picture doesn't have marks all over the place, right? And so what you have is you're starting, you say to yourself, well, that'll do for now. That'll do for now. That's do, that's, I know what that is. And it may be enough. I mean, I'm not really, I can't second guess myself anymore that I can really truly second guess a student. Um, what you're seeing happen here is the big general impression is coming out of the fog, though. The... Um, the um, the form you see you see this emergence that's starting to happen here. This way of working just does that, right? It's a gift. It's the gift of all over the place at once and all the horses at once. It's a gift. The, qu the question is how hard is it to acquire the gift? I guess. Isn't that what uh, what, what the um, young woman said? Uh, uh, who's uh, quoted in this Argent book, didn't she say? And then the lights did look like the lights just came on. But this, but this, but this uh, sense of form is part of the general impression, yet we don't sit there and say, I'm trying to get the general impression of the sense of form. We just do the next thing, okay? We just do the, 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 the thing that either would be most helpful or is the least, um, uh, uh, or, or rather I should say is the most strong, and often they're the same thing. But whatever we do, we do it visually, so it's in visual order. It's funny, you know, since I wasn't taught this with words the way I was taught, um, I mean, Gamble said, do as I say, not as I do, but Gamble didn't show us this. We actually drew outlines like an academic would. And um, so the content for me had to be evolved, that's the, the content for the purposes of teaching had to be evolved by me. And I will have to tell you, I'm still evolving it. I'm saying it to you in words that are still under construction, if you, if you follow what I'm saying. You know, and so whoever said uh, all the horses at once, that was a great aphorism. And who, who knows how long that had been handed down. Uh, but there isn't a lot of conversation, including from Sargent. I mean, points and angles is one piece of good conversation. These are aphorisms of the trade, you know, the shop talk, <laughs> in a sense, that's, you know, more craft talk, um, it, 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 really, it really holds this whole thing together. One of the reasons you need to study with somebody is because you need to have these phrases at the right time. Or you have to have these phrases minimally, just have them. And when you're working, think, is that, is that what that is? I mean, these uh, axiomatic expressions are that big. I, I, I think you really can't be a truly good painter if you don't have both the mental, verbal component and the, uh, and the hand-eye, you know, jock, whatever you want to call it, you know, the talent component. <laughs> Talent's not a good word. I don't even mean that. I really mean just the physical workman thing. But you got to have, you have to be reading. You have to do your reading, you know. Uh, you need, you know, you, somebody, I can tell you stuff all day long and you think, well, yeah, that's how you do this. Oh, that's how you do that. But it actually, you'll find that you're stronger if you've heard it somewhere else. Maybe, in, maybe just having heard somebody else say it slightly differently. And I'm talking about a good painter. Don't listen to anybody who you don't look at their work and say, that's good painting. If, I mean, use your best judgment. I mean, look at the great history of painting. And, and look at those people. And even compare today's painters to those people and say, I'm, I'm going to listen to this guy if he's got words. You know, somebody better. The guy is one of those guys. Uh, but you're, you need words, okay? I love this expression that the, the, the uh, Germans have. I think it's called, you have, I think they say you have to name the pig. <laughs> but, but that's what these expressions are. Rather, it's rather naming the, the idea, the underlying idea, all over the place at once in the start. Um, all the horses at once. These are ideas, right? Coming out of a fog is an idea. 
By the way, this picture is coming out of a fog. When I talk to you about the joints and rollers, I'm actually talking about the joints are the points that are emerging out of the fog. The rollers are the fog, if you want to put it that way. Those great unifying areas. That whole area across the, the bottom of the thing and the uh, big wide massing up through the top, right now going around the entire skull, that's this great unified mass, right? Even on the right side where nothing's been drawn yet to speak of, there's a fog, right? Well, this crazy guy is finally getting down to uh, something actually rather useful there around the leg, so I guess he finally woke up to the fact that he needed a, uh, he needed a right corner, a bit of data down there in the right corner. Remember, make these areas as like as you can, put as much time as you need to into them, and it'll go by faster over time. You'll get to that point where you actually can articulate them more, more efficiently. But put enough time in so that you've actually got something as useful, right? If it doesn't look enough like itself, it won't be useful. It has to be enough like itself in edge, in contrast, in, in um, angle, in shape, you know, uh, minimally. And so make it as like as you can uh, and make, you know, find good points for use. Sometimes the points you have to use aren't really sharp edged, so don't fake them. I mean, if, it's, if it just makes a soft point, then do the look of nature there, but get it, get it doing all that it does so, that it actually, so, so it actually can be useful. When I say what it does, you see that I'm not talking about what it is? This whole game is about what things do, what values do when they meet, for example, or what, what values do in relation to each other. Uh, you know, so everything we do, it's, it, it, nothing we do, I should say, is about the thing. We're not, we're not doing the, the, the um, <laughs> I think I just dropped my charcoal. We're not doing the, uh, um, uh, we don't have a picture idea, we have a visual idea, a visual. Everything in the, in the visual world is that. We don't need to know. You've got to have the naive eye, right? Just maintain that idea that, that there's value in that. That's what you're seeing here. I don't know horses from Adam, right? But I know angles, and I know angles from angles. Do you see what I mean? So maintain that idea, okay, that, um, uh, that the um, uh, process itself, this is funny, I, as much as I, I've got to watch what I say here. Um, but the process itself is, is, is totally evolved for the Impressionist. I'd say somebody painting from life, it's totally evolved from the visual content. It's got nothing to do with the actual content, okay? It's just a product of good work, you know, getting angles right, getting, getting value uh, transitions right, getting uh, shape right, you know, and more particularly, getting those things right in relation to each other, right? Before you know it, you have the nose of a horse, or you have the uh, you have a mannequin over in the corner. All right, um, I think we've got another maybe ten minutes on this, so let's let's see where we take it. It's nice to see me getting down to that right corner. Now, when you if you wait too long to get into a place like that, you can set yourself up to have problems elsewhere, right? But obviously, I'm not worried about a thing. I've done enough stuff down there, and 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 have it. I believe it all. It's all lining up pretty well. And that's a big, that's one of the biggest angles in the picture, some of that junk down there up to the, say, the, the top left corner of the horse's head. That's a big, long line. That whole conversation, by the way, about long lines is an, an important one, too. Um, you know, Sargent said, draw the longest line you can remember, and, uh, or the longest line you can. I can't remember how he said it, but what I'm trying to do when I go out here, I'm not doing little hack lines, because I actually can draw, I can draw around a nose and down through a lip, right? If you don't think of it as a nose and a lip, you don't find it complex. I mean, you won't find it difficult, but if you think of it as a horse's nose and lip and you try to think this is behind that and this in front of that, you will have a problem. But if you think of them the way everybody learned to think, and I'm not talking about the Soroyas and the Zorns and the Boston School guys, uh, when you start working the way we're talking about now, you're drawing the look of nature all the time, every minute, and to do that you have to have memorized a longish line. Longish because the line has to have some internal uh, context so you're drawing a line from, you know, from somewhere through a bump or two and then, and then out again, right? So there's enough data there for it to have context. Enough for it to, for example, suggest an angle uh, and things like that. But then there are long lines, which is what I wanted to say. Though. So you see the top of the head going down to the tip of the nose. That's a long line. But going all the way down from the top of the ear down to the left shoulder of the horse, that's a very long line, right? 
And those long lines are hugely important. The, you know, those are like the great proportions in a picture, like the width from the leg of the mannequin to the left side of the horse's shoulder. That width to the height of the horse, those are hugely important proportions to get right. And those, those are the things you might see me overlooking in this conversation if I don't have the, I might be overlooking it in my own work if I don't have a decent right point to get, to get a, a um, right in width to the left side of the uh, chest so I can feel that width to the height of the horse. Every moment, by the way, this is what, this kind of painting is, you think about this all the time, you just never stop thinking, but you never start thinking about anything else. You're just doing visual things. And we're talking specifically just think darks on lights, <laughs> it's okay? We're just doing visual things and the way they land, right? So the, what they do when they land. So you see, a, I see that I'm casting the shadow off that arm of the mannequin. Now remember we, Hale says we, we draw the leopard by the spots. That's a case in point. I'm not drawing the arm of the mannequin and then casting a shadow. I'm actually drawing the cast shadow because that's what reads. I kept looking at that. Eventually, I was thinking, why didn't I see that sooner? But you never know, actually, and you don't get try to. You're not going to find this perfect method, but you will find if you do something like that too late, and you could have done it earlier, you'll you, something in our way of self evolving will you'll be smarter in the next one, right? But it's, there's a there's a decent chance that it wasn't particularly needed at that at, at any particular point in here. Partially, uh, again, if you blow your eyes, most of that is still hard to see compared to just the way the arm ends that big sweeping aspect of the, of the neck. So you see me pulling things together up there now. You don't do that artificially. So you don't just mass in that hair area around the head, around behind the right ear. You don't just mass that in mindlessly. You see that it shifted from being a significant flat dark to having middle tones in it. So I'm, but it's still the general sweeping impression of those tones. I could be speaking to you, Carol, on this one, uh, where you asked about that, how to maintain that, that, that sense of all the, how all that stuff hangs together. Uh, it, it, the tendency is to either make it too flat or make it too busy. And what we want to do is find some way to make it do enough to, so it's not the wrong value, but mostly just figure out how wide it is and, where it, you know, and what, it, what it does where it meets the next thing, for example. Or another way of saying it is, or another thing to say about it is there's this big movement, say the mass of the jaw value it's a dark, it's a flat value, it's a flat, classic flat shadow. But it actually then shifts and evolves and wanders up right up into the back, right through the skull, right through, the, I'm sorry, right through the mane of the horse, right? Which you can see I'm looking for that unity right now. Even when you're looking to unify stuff, don't just do it mindlessly. Go find out, as Ang, uh, as, as Degas said, go find out where it's going to end. He said anybody who drew a line with that much authority, and I would suggest you in a mass with that much authority, has to know where it's starting and where it's going to end. So you see there's going to be this hunt for um, the, the right edge up there, or something readable up there. So it might be the right edge of that mass to the right of the ear, the, which if you blur your eye, you'll see what, I, what I'm referring to. And again, these widths aren't the same for you as for me, and that's one of the more dramatic ones um, when I'm drawing from that point of view. You can see the horse's mane is still uh, is too light. So that's one of those things where you can't leave that very long because it's destroying the sense of the third dimension. It becomes its own back straggler, okay? So shape is not everything. At some point, you have to knock that back and pull things into unity. You're constantly pulling things back into unity. So you can go out there and say, I gotta find this location, this shape, and you do work on one thing at a time. So you might be saying, I gotta find the shape. There, I'm doing it with that. You make the shape and then you realize, oh gee, but, it, but it's all fuzzy. It's, it's a totally lost edge or something, or it looks different. And you immediately do that and then look at it again to see if you got the shape right with that look. But you do isolate a particular thing. Bobby Jones' idea that, um, that uh, a guy who's making a... He said, oh, Bobby Jones says that when I make, uh, think about three things, I make a bad shot. When I think about two things, I make a, an okay shot. But when I think about one thing, I make a great shot. We're talking about that even more specifically here. Uh, when you think about values, do values. And do value relationships and make great values. Uh, but don't think you're out there making shapes, values, edges, and all these other things at once. You have to actually literally do one thing at a time. We happen to do it so fast that I say so, so the sequence is relatively swift once you get in the habit of putting down an idea, seeing that it's right, and then moving on to the next back straggler. But, um, but there are a number of things you can do in our world. For example, even if you paint, if you paint from a sharp edge, a, a sharp edge, and then do a middle tone to knock the edge off of it. 
Or you have the same problem as if you were to put down a fuzzy blob to find a location and then have to pull off a sharper edge off of that. It makes no difference how you work, but it makes a difference if you keep leaving it like that with sharp edges. So again, the general impression should be projecting toward us. The parts that project toward us should always be projecting toward us. And yet we're not thinking about anything projecting toward us. It's just gifts. It's gifts of, of edge relationships, value relationships, size relationships. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I know, Whitaker, I'm just thinking. <laughs> Uh, just watching, I should say. So you can see I'm going up the side of the um, shoulder of the horse on that side and actually being more specific now about alignments. I, know, I remember now that having done this, that there were a series of angles there that weren't actually handled well enough. Have this idea in mind, by the way, that the first time you get around a picture, it's going to be well enough because remember those first few marks are just guesses. They're pigs and pokes, the expression is, right? So... After you've gotten around to a few more things, and, and, and you, these things now actually have better, they have context. And so they were the context for everything else, but now they themselves have better context. You know, several things have come into being. And that has, for example, to do with the, 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 the sort of the V of the, of the, of the horse's shoulder. Which, by the way, differently, the face is turned and shoulders so that that part's getting narrower, but as the face, as, as my position, I, I should say, is, is more frontal, the chest gets wider, so you can see how these, these shifts are different for you guys, the viewer. So here we are down at the very base. I believe I'm moving that, that point over. I'm finding angle issues, right? So I'm moving that point of the, uh, again, that figure is standing on what appears to be a white, a piece of white plaster. <laughs> Just look over there what it is. Uh, it's a decorative thing from a stone from a stone fireplace or something. Uh, so I'm being way specific right there now. I really want that point. I want it to be exactly. In the, I want the right effect, the right contrast in the right place, right? The sharpness of edge, and the right shape, the right look. Everything to do with it. If I'm making that edge, I can make it more like. Remember, by the time you do something, you've moved it say three times. You should really nail the likeness. Don't be out there moving things and doing crap work and doing worse work than before. It'll just really discourage you. Make sure that every time you move something, you make it more like, okay? And whatever you've made like about it before, make it even more like. Give it, a, give it another look this time and make it even more like. For example, if you're improving angle and you already think you had the shape, then make that shape even more beautiful. Learn it again. Make it even more beautiful this time. And make the edge more beautiful too. Again, you see the need for more specificity uh, in parts of that figure. Uh, I remember uh, that a certain part of that top of the head was showing on that mannequin. Uh, and um, it just showed enough to be annoying. You know, it didn't feel like it was strategic and important. And yet there comes a point in which things are, you know. So you can see that I'm working with the strength of the right hand of the mannequin down there. And I'm working with the points on the leg that that tend to to, to make points like the angle of the back of the leg comes down and, and, and there's that cast shadow. I'm doing all that stuff. Those are things that are very adequate for the job and visually not strong. Um, if you look away, if you blur your eyes, you'll see they're not strong visually. But specificity is your friend, right? Just don't be too specific too soon. You can't be too specific in the sense of the way you make it, but you can be too convinced that you're right about where it is. So make it as like as you can the first time, but be willing to move and be ready to move. And, uh, you know, believe that you can be off. Uh, that, I believe, right, right there is actually flattening that shape out so I make a better point of that point where the leg meets. And now, so I'm flattening the shadow or flattening the value, whatever that value is. You can see, by the way, that that value from the leg all the way up to the horse isn't exactly one value, but I'm almost treating it like it is. And for a while, you can get away with that. If you blur your eyes and these contrasts aren't significant, and that's a key word, by the way, significant versus insignificant. That's one of the reasons you blur your eye, though, is you want to see what's significant out there. And, uh, and how things hang together is significant, by the way, not just these, these screaming points, but the screaming points are what we truly mean when we say, what do you really want me to work on to your painting? You know, what should I work on first? To your, to, not to your painting, to your, 
to your ensemble. So do you notice that the, pay, the, the, the draftsman here is all over the place? Starts at the top, goes to the bottom. He's over on the nose and the eye somewhat, and then he's down on the right side of the, putting some parts of this cre of the uh, mannequin in. Then he's, then he's down on the nose further. He's on the chest and both sides in that area at different times, but all over the place, just traveling round and round. And that's very much the idea. Keep your, Gamble used to say hop, 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 and I know he gets that directly from the Boston School way of thinking. Just keep hopping around. Just keep, when you see something, get all the ramifications, give it right to this, to that, to this, to that. And don't fail to think that this is not just, liter this is not project. We have this, I shouldn't say, this is not just progress. This is, the model is, is a Chinese, that three steps forward, two steps back. Uh, I think it's proverbial in some context. But, um, but three steps forward. Well, the two steps back are to secure what you've got, to secure the ground. Um, so you're not just running off in one direction and just keep plowing through. You go back, and now that you know this, now that you know that, now you know this, and oh, then you also know that. And then you can go back to that first thing, and you say, oh, no, yeah, then that means, oh, yeah, and this, 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 that changes it. Okay, and that, it, because everything is about this. It's rather like a Rubik's Cube, except that I don't want to make it sound hard to you, that um, all these parts are interrelating. Once you realize that the drawing is, that it's seeing, is, is seeing relationally, you understand why you're working like this. You're working from players that talk to each other, that have these inner relationships that are key, that are important, which is again why I talk about the strong ones to the weak ones. It's great, you guys are getting all this stuff free. This is easy, this is, this is everything. <laughs> Good luck trying to use it. Uh, but make efforts, you know, whatever. Uh, see what you can do with it. So when you when a person is working on those points down there, it's because they happen to be stronger. They make better pointiness. That now they're very little points. That's probably the reason I wasn't there in the first place because there there's significant parts of this that have to do with the whole. And there's a lot of little things in there that. If you tangle yourself in them, you'll have too many confusing things to try to relate to the whole. So you hang on to maybe one or two points. I always say that every area of a picture has, well, what we think of as platoon leaders. If you're in the military, you, the first thing they do is they put you in little, little they put you into, into divisions and companies, and before you know it, you're in a platoon with maybe 15 or 20 other guys. I forget if there's an actual number in, in the U.S. version, but we... Um, uh, but there's a, but then there's this guy they appoint to be the platoon leader, and, and uh, sometimes they guess wrong. <laughs> but 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 the point is that every area of a painting has a platoon leader, has a visual leader, and so you don't need every little thing in every part of every painting just to be a good person. You know what I mean? You need people that are useful. You need people that know how to lead the area. This may be the end, guys. Uh oh. Well, if it is, <laughs> I apologize that I didn't get us further because that whole, that whole um, um, extra hour uh, has been wiped out. But I've given you all the information you could possibly need. It's just a matter of keeping on pulling it together and take your sweet time. You make statements, you pull together. You make a statement, you pull together. Somebody told me it was like jazz. <laughs> so they say there's, there's something in jazz like that. I've never been a musician in any way. <laughs> And uh, can't tell you I'm even particularly a fan of jazz, except that I see that what this guy said, that what guy do, he'll sit down at the piano and he'll play a handful of notes, cha 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 blah, whatever. And before you know, all these other guys are trying to get in the hang and the swing and pull it all into line with this guy. And that's what I say about like the platoon leader. It's rather like that. The platoon leader has uh, has those uh, 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 or whatever else you put down. You have this need to pull it together and say. Well, if that's true, then this, then that, then this, then that, and you correct all the things in relation to that point. You've only made one point, but you have a number of corrections to make to pull it together into unity to make it right to many of the things that are already sitting there. All right, I think I've done it, uh, folks. So uh, before I make this into two hours, I think we've done close to an hour. Um, so, all right, good. Um, Go ahead and uh, throw your questions at me. I know that where the first one's gonna be, why don't you finish it? And I already answered that question. So please do subscribe, uh, share, uh, share a lot. I mean, this is, this is good information, right? You've never seen it like this, have you? Maybe somebody you know does it, but I don't know that I've, I never saw anybody do it. 
um, when I was studying. Um, but you can see what it's doing. You can see the, the, the fully encompassing look that it gives you without any artificial lines of any kind, any preliminary drawing of any kind. Uh, and it's all simultaneously and it's all impressionistic, if you want to call it that way. I think of this actually as what Velasquez was saying they were doing under Carlos Duran, which was, um, which was this advancement past what they called primitive drawing. So, um, all right, so there you are.